In the last two videos, we established that the Quran and the Bible basically have the same teachings, and it's very, very hard to find any differences between them. That made us think that maybe Muhammad copied the Quran from the Bible and pretended it was a revelation from God. Or do they have the same teachings because they came from the same God who sent us all prophets? But if we already have the Bible, why do we need another revelation? What's the point of sending a new book? So we decided to raise our voices and ask this question. How to know if the Quran is really God's words and not just copied from older books? We searched and we found the answer to these questions in a form of a challenge. A challenge raised by the Quran itself. The Quran claims that older scriptures have been altered by men and this is why God sent a new revelation to correct the manipulations done to his older books. Quran claims that it has zero errors and contradictions because it's not written by people. And to prove that older scriptures have been modified and manipulated, you should look for contradictions in them. Do they not read and reflect upon the Quran? If it had been from any other than God, they would have found within it much contradiction. Let's see if we can prove that claim to be right or wrong. Open your Bible with me. Number 1. Luke 3.23 Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph, the son of Heli. Matthew 1.16 And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Did you notice something strange here? Who was the father of Joseph exactly? Luke says it's Heli, but Matthew says it's Jacob. These are two pages in the Bible, and one of them at least is a lie. Which one is it? Number 2. Acts 1.18 With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all of his intestines spilled out. What a shameful death. Matthew 27.5 So Judas threw the money into the temple and left, then he went away and hanged himself. Did you notice something strange here? How did Judas die exactly? Acts says he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. But Matthew says he hanged himself. One of them at least is a lie. Or maybe both. Who knows? Number 3. 2 Kings 24.8 Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 3 months. 2 Chronicles 36.8 Jehoiakim was 8 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 3 months and 10 days. Did you notice something strange here? I think you did. How much time did he reign in Jerusalem? 2 Kings says he reigned 3 months. 2 Chronicles says he reigned 3 months and 10 days. Which one is it? And how old was he when he became king? Two kings says he was 18 years old when he became king, but two chronicles says he was 8 years old when he became king. One of them at least is a lie. Maybe both. Who knows? Number 4. Two kings 8, 26. Ahaziah was 22 years old when he became king. Two chronicles 22, 2. 40 and 2 years old was Ahaziah when he became Turin. Did you notice something? How old was Ahaziah when he became king? Two kings says he was 22 years old, but two chronicles says he was 42 years old. Which one is it? And if you check the evolution of the Bible over the years, they keep changing verses in it. They keep modifying and removing information and adding information. If you check this exact verse, 2 Chronicles 22, see how many times it was changed and sometimes they say it is 42 years old and sometimes 22, based on their whims and what they want you to believe in when you read the next version. So if the final version of the Bible we are reading right now was being changed and manipulated over the years by men, how can we consider it God's words? Number 5. Book of Ezra 1, 9-11 this is the number of them, 30 gold platters, 1,000 silver platters, 29 knives, 30 gold basins, 410 silver basins of a similar kind, 1,000 other articles. All the articles of gold and silver were 5,400. 
However, Rod's verse didn't have a calculator because the total is 2,499, not 5,400. And absolutely, God didn't make a math mistake. If it is not God who wrote that, then who? And why are we cherishing this person's book? Why does this person deserve our full obedience? He just was a guy without a calculator. Number six, at the time of writing the Bible, the best minds of the world believed that the earth is flat. It was their understanding based on their own scientific knowledge. Now let's read. Matthew 4, 8. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Whoever wrote this thinks that if you go on top of a very high mountain, you can see every country on earth. He didn't know yet that the earth isn't flat, but of course God already knew that. So do you still believe that these are words of God? Check this one out. Jeremiah 16.19 The nations will come from the ends of the earth. Someone please explain to me where are the ends of the earth? Job 37.3 And send it to the ends of the earth. Again, where are these ends of the earth? Isaiah 11.12 From the four corners of the earth. Looks like the earth is flat and has four corners. Whoever wrote this thought that the earth is like a square piece of paper with four corners. God, of course, will never say that. Revelation 7.1 And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor any tree. Again, whoever wrote this thought that the earth is flat square with four corners, and there is an angel holding each corner, so the wind will not blow it. Do you still believe these are words of God? Number 7. Whoever wrote the Bible thought that mountains are the pillars and the foundation of heaven. Without mountains, heaven will fall on us. Job 26.11 The pillars of heaven tremble. 2 Samuel 22.8 Then the earth shook and quaked, and the foundations of the heavens trembled. Do you still believe these are words of God? Number 8. Jonah 2, 5 and 6 To the roots of the mountains I sank down. Whoever wrote these verses describing the sinking story of Jonah thought that if you go deep in the sea, you can actually go under the land and under the mountains. He thought that the continents that we live on and the mountains are swimming over water. He even didn't know that mountains have roots deep underground. Psalm 136, 6 who spreads out the earth upon the waters. Again, I don't know why they think that the whole earth is a big ocean and continents are like big boats floating over them. Psalm 24, 1 and 2 The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. For the third time, guys, we should believe that Europe is a very big boat floating over the water. Do you still believe these are words of God? Number 9. Genesis 1, 6-9 And God said, Let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated water under the vault from water above the vault, and it was so. God called the vault sky. This is the complete concept of earth based on the Bible. Water under, water above, and both water areas are separated by the earth and the sky. So the whole universe is endless amount of water, and the earth and the sky is in the middle. This is why the sky is blue, because there is water over it. And don't forget that the mountains are the pillars of the sky, holding the sky up. Do you still believe that these are words of God? Number 10. Genesis 1, 3-16 and God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. He called the light day, and the darkness he called night. This is the first day. Remember that. Number 16. God made two great lights. The greater light to govern the day, and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. The fourth day. So God created light and day and night in the first day, then God created the sun and the moon and the stars in the fourth day. 
Don't you think that they should have been the opposite? How was their light and day and night before creating the sun and the moon and the stars? Do you still believe these are words of God? Number 11, Genesis 3:14. After Adam and Eve ate the forbidden tree, the woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. First of all, serpents don't eat dust. Second of all, if one serpent made a mistake somehow, why should all the innocent newborn serpents crawl on their bellies too? Does that make sense to you? Is that your idea of God? Do you think God is a childish angry kid who cannot control his fury that he punishes newborn serpents for a sin that they didn't commit? What about number 16? To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Do you really think God hates all newborn innocent women and made them all suffer pain for a crime that they didn't commit? Do you really think we have an unfair God? Do you really think that God is full of hate towards one gender? Maybe this is why God chose to have a son, not a daughter. In other words, do you think God is sexist? Or does it make more sense to believe that God isn't and this book was written by a sexist person? Number 12, Leviticus 11, 20 to 23. All flying insects that walk on all fours are to be regarded as unclean by you. There are however some flying insects that walk on all fours that you may eat. Number 23, but all other flying insects that have four legs, you are to regard them as clean. There is one problem with these verses. I will give you a second to guess. There are no insects with four legs. Do you still believe that these are words of God? Number 13, Mark 4, 31. It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. There is one problem with this verse. I will give you a second to guess. Yes, the mustard seed is not the smallest seed on earth. Do you still believe that these are words of God? Number 14, Leviticus 14, 52 and 53. He shall purify the house with the bird's blood. 53 and it will be clean do you think god is telling us to use the bird's blood to clean our houses should we start buying bird's blood instead of detergents do you still believe these are words of god number 15 numbers 5 12 to 31 this one is too long, you can just pause the video and read it yourself. It says that if a man doubts his wife and he wants to know if she is faithful to him or not, he should take her to a priest. Then the priest shall take some holy water and put some dust in it and then tell her that if she was faithful to her husband, this water will not harm her. But if she cheated on her husband, this water will bring a curse on her. May this water bring a curse enter your body, so that your abdomen swells or your womb miscarries. The problem is I think dirty water with dust most likely will hurt her stomach, whether she was faithful or not. Do you still believe that these are words of God? Number 16. Genesis 2, 2 and 3. By the seventh day, God has finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Rested. The God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Do you really think that God was tired after working six days he needed to rest? Is this the image of God you are worshipping? A God who gets tired and needs to rest? Do you still believe these are words of God? I wouldn't be surprised if they wrote God needed to drink coffee on the sixth day or something. Number 17. 
Genesis 32, 28, the man said, From now on, your name will no longer be Jacob. You will be called Israel, because you have wrestled with God and with men, and you have won. This verse describes a very amusing wrestling round. Jacob versus God. Who do you think will win? Exactly. Of course Jacob won the fight against God. Maybe because God was tired from creating the heavens and the earth and he needed rest. That's why he lost against Jacob. Do you still believe these are words of God? Number 18. Jesus states that the believers will be able to handle snake bites and will be immune from any poison they might happen to drink and will be able to heal the sick. Mark 16, 17 and 18 And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I haven't seen one believer until now who can handle snake bites and drink poison and heal the sick. Actually, even religious leaders themselves, which represent the best of believers, when confronted with this, they refuse to drink poison. My brother has given me a deadly poison and he wants me to drink it. <laughs> He wants me to make a show and tell you that it is true what is written in Mark 16, that if we drink something that is poisoned, we will not die. Now, very strange, you see, I believe in God. I have experienced the Holy Spirit and in our family, we have experienced the Holy Spirit as a reality. And the Holy Spirit tells us what is going to happen. And my wife told me, Thursday night, Stanley, be careful, someone will try to poison you. <laughs> if you want to kill me, I must have five minutes more. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you that in front of Herod, Jesus did not open his mouth according to the scripture and Jesus did not make a show of the miracles and when you gave me this question today I recognized the devil in you and I'm not going to obey the devil I'm not going to make a show what are you afraid of man aren't you a believer don't worry you will be fine if they drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt them he will never drink it because he knows it's a lie and he will never admit it's a lie because he makes his earning by lying to you if he admits it's a lie, he will lose his job and fame. He will be just a poor guy without income. He's saying that this man in the audience is the devil. But the verse says that believers can cast out devils. Why don't you cast him out? The real victims here are the poor innocent people who believed in the Bible and followed it blindly. And got severely hurt because of that. Look at the famous preacher whose faith centered on a passage in the Bible promising protection from snakes. A rattlesnake took his life. Matt Wolford, a renowned Pentecostal serpent handler, died after suffering a bite from one of the snakes that he used to show his devotion to God. Do you still believe these are words of God? 
Number 19, 2 Chronicles 18, 21 to 22. I will go and be a deceiving spirit in the mouths of his prophets, he said. You will succeed in enticing them, said the Lord. Go and do it. So now the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouths of these prophets of yours. The Lord has decreed disaster for you. These two verses alone destroy the whole Bible. They clearly say that God put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of these prophets of yours. If this verse is true, then all the information we got from these prophets is false. And if the information we have from these prophets is true, then these verses are lies. Choose one. Do you still believe that these are words of God? Number 20. 1 Samuel 15.3 Listen now to the message from the Lord. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Do you think God will order the killing of women and children? Do you think God will order the killing of infants? Infants, even donkeys, why donkeys? Are these the words of God or the words of a terrorist? Number 21. Numbers 31, 14 to 18. Moses was angry with the officers of the army, the commanders of thousands, and commanders of hundreds who returned from the battle. Have you allowed all women to live? He asked them. Now kill all the boys, and kill every woman who had slept with a man. But save for yourselves every girl who has never slept with a man. Do you believe that God ordered Moses to kill the women and the boys, and to leave the virgin girls for the men to enjoy them? This is exactly what happened in World War II by Soviet occupation troops in Germany. Hundreds of thousands and possibly as many as two million girls were raped by troops. Do you believe that supposedly Jesus is the God of Moses and Jesus commanded him to kill women and rape virgins? Are these the words of God or the words of a terrorist? Number 22. Leviticus 25, 44. Your male and female slaves are to come from nations around you. From them, you may buy slaves. 1 Peter 2, 18. Slaves, submit yourselves to your masters. Titus 2, 9. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything. Exodus 21, 20-21. Everyone who beats their male or female slave with a rod must be punished if the slave dies as a direct result. But they are not to be punished if the slave recovers after a day or two, since the slave is their property. Do you think that God permits enslaving people from surrounding nations and beating them up with a rod, but while making sure they don't die in the process? So you can beat up your slave until he or she has internal bleeding and broken bones, but as long as he or she stay alive for a day or two, it's okay, since they are your property? Don't worry God, I will make sure they don't die on the same day as me beating them. They will struggle from internal bleeding and broken bones without dying on the same day. And that's okay, I think, because they are my property. Do you still believe these are words of God? Number 23. Deuteronomy 25, 11-12 If two men are fighting and the wife of one of them comes to rescue her husband from his assailant and she reaches out and seizes him by his private parts, you shall cut off her hand, show her no pity. Sisters in humanity, don't defend your husband or they will cut off your hand. Seems like whoever wrote this verse had a problem with women kicking him in the crouch. Do you still believe these are words of God? Number 24 And this is a really nice one. 
Genesis 1932. Let's get our father to drink wine and then sleep with him and preserve our family line through our father. That night they got their father to drink wine and the older daughter went and slept with him. The next day the older daughter said to the younger, last night I slept with my father. Let's get him to drink wine again tonight and you go in and sleep with him. So both of Lot's daughter became pregnant by the father. While in 2 Peter 2 7 it says, And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless. So Genesis describes Lot as an awful human being, but Peter describes Lot as a righteous man. So is he a righteous man or a man who gets drunk every night and sleeps with both of his daughters repeatedly until he gets his own daughters pregnant from him? Which one is it? Do you still believe that these are words of God? Number 25 2 Samuel 24 9 Jacob reported the number of fighting men to the king. In Israel, there were 800,000 able-bodied men who can handle a sword, and in Judah, 500,000. 1 Chronicles 21 5 Jacob reported the number of fighting men to David. In all Israel, there are 1,100,000 men who can handle a sword, including 470,000 in Judah. So were there 800,000 men in Israel or 1,100,000 men? Were there 500,000 in Judah or 470,000? Is the first one lying or the second one lying? Or both? Do you still believe these are words of God? A textual critic takes the ancient manuscripts of the Bible, the pieces of parchment that were found all over the world, and he has to learn uh, Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, Latin, you know, these languages that these parchments have been found in. And he has to take these scriptures and try to find out where they came from, uh, why there are variations in the many different versions of the same parchment. Let's say you have Matthew chapter 1 from the Bible. There might be 5,000 different variant readings of Matthew chapter 1 in six languages. And so he has to be able to take all these and sift through them, try to find out why there's so many variations of the readings, and then determine which one is the original. Um, and that's not as easy a task as it seems. You could figure, you know, which one of the oldest is probably a more original, which is not the case since there are no originals. Uh, you might have one parchment that is the oldest parchment of the of the of the group but it might be a copy of 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 a copy with with laden with mistakes if you read about noah in the bible there is the story about noah saving uh, uh humanity from the flood with an ark and all of that there is this in the bible there's other another aspect to the story of noah that, that not many people know about unless they actually take time to open a bible this will not be preached from any pulpit anywhere is that the, the bible says that noah was an alcoholic this is the Bible's portrayal of Noah, or Nuh salam, that he was an alcoholic, he was a drunkard. This is the word used in the Bible, that he was a man given to alcohol. And <clears throat> I'm a psychology major, and my, my, my uh, field of specialty is mental illnesses, and, and alcoholism is one of those, is, is a mental illness. And I know from seeing alcoholism's effect on one of my close uh, friend's parents, uh, I know that someone who is truly addicted to alcohol, and if Noah lived for so long addicted to alcohol, he was seriously addicted to alcohol, um, it is hard for someone addicted to alcohol to hold down a nine to five job working at McDonald's flipping hamburgers, much less construct an ark to save humanity from a flood that's never happened. So that stopped me for a moment in my tracks. And I said, no, as an alcoholic, you know, and, and it, it bothered me for a minute because I said, I, you know, things started popping in my mind like, if Noah was a drunkard, how did he know God was talking to him? Because, you know, I've seen some people, the alcoholics, you know, you were just asleep in my dog's food bowl the other night drooling and now you're telling me you were talking to God last night. You know, this, you know, to rationally that would not make sense to me. That's like, you know, an alcoholic on the street coming to you and tell you God's talking to him. You know, he has no, this would give this man no validity. This man has no validity with anyone. So, I didn't pay it too much attention. It caught me, but I said, you know what, I'm going to keep going. Because there's one thing that you don't do in Christianity, and I'll tell you what it, was, it is in a minute when I started doing it. Um, then I came across the story of Lot, or Lut alayhi salam. And we all know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in, in these stories, but there's a, another very twisted story in the Bible about Lot and his daughters. There's a story of Lot and his daughters uh, uh, in, in, in the Bible that says his daughters got him drunk one night and seduced him and committed incest with him. 
This is the Bible, this is one of the Bible portrayals of the prophets of God. And it says that David saw, uh, saw this woman named Bathsheba, and she was one of the most beautiful women of her time. Uh, and she happened to be married to one of the commanders of his army named Uriah. But David on this day decided that he was not able to resist his temptation uh, to be with this woman Bathsheba, so he did. Uh, and he committed adultery with her. And knowing that he did this, he, the, the, the way that he decided to cover it up was he sent a letter to the generals of his army saying that when the battle was fierce, for everyone to pull back and abandon Uriah uh, so that he would be killed. And when he dies, then he could have Bathsheba, no harm, no foul. So David went from being the slayer of Goliath, the hero for man, to uh, an adulterer, a, a, a plotter, and a murderer. And so this is when I really caught myself and said, hold on now. Something's wrong here. Something's got to give. I said, because to me, God's prophets in my mind were people of example, people who I could follow as an example, someone who was supposed to be the best of us so that we could follow them and emulate them. And I'm, they're turning out to be worse than some of the people that you see on America's Most Wanted. David is somebody that if I only knew this about him from the Bible, I see him coming down the street, I'm going the other way and calling 911 because he has to have a warrant out on him for something. This is what I'm thinking in my mind. This man is not an honorable man at all. He, he, okay, he killed Goliath, yeah, but he killed this other guy named Uriah to be able to commit adultery with his wife. So I, 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 did, I committed the cardinal sin in Christianity. I started asking questions. Um, this is the one thing you do not do in Christianity is you don't ask questions, especially not about issues like this. Um, so I went to my pastor and I started asking questions, you know, what, what, what's going on here? You know, pastor, there's, there's a, a very bad recurring uh, habit about these men in the Bible. What is, what is the deal here? And I remember he told me the same thing that I, almost every pastor or every evangelist or anyone I talked to about this, same, same, same answer, almost like it was programmed. They would put their hand on my shoulder and say, Brother Joshua, don't let a little bit of knowledge wreck your faith because you're not justified by knowledge, you're justified by faith. Uh, and they would quote me verses like, lean not on understanding, you know, Paul's, we're justified by faith in Jesus Christ. You know, this is all, they would quote this whole line of thing to me like it was already pre-programmed, they, like they programmed in pastor school that people are going to ask you questions and here's the answer. Long after the death of Moses, some of the believers started changing God's message to us and made up some stories about him. And made a very interesting decision that if you're not born to one of them, you cannot be one of the believers. Because God is exclusive only to them and their children and then they disbelieved in Jesus. They are not following God's teachings anymore. They made up their own man-made exclusive religion. And now, instead of calling them believers, we just call them Jews. Unfortunately, the same happened with Jesus. At first, people followed him and obeyed God, and they were believers. Jesus ordered people to follow the laws of Moses and be more righteous than the Jews. Matthew 5.17 Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Matthew 5.20 Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus actually told people that if you do not follow the laws of Moses perfectly, even more than the Jews, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven or paradise. Then after Jesus, one Turkish guy called Paul claimed that while he was traveling in the desert alone in Syria, he talked to God. And then God told him that Jesus made a mistake asking us to follow the laws of Moses and we should not follow them anymore. And all the laws of God are garbage. Everything that Jesus taught or did in his life is a curse. And by the way, he was the son of God and he died for our sins. So now we can sin as much as we want. It will be forgiven because God killed his son already. He literally used the word curse to describe God's laws for humanity. Galatians 3.10 For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. And now people disbelieve Jesus and believe this Turkish guy who claimed to be talking to God and asking us to ignore what Jesus commanded. We can't call them believers anymore, sorry. We have to call them Christians. Which is very ironic because they think that everything that Christ was doing and asking people to do is a curse. That is exactly what their new prophet Paul said. The more accurate name will be Paulians. I'm sorry, that's the truth.
If you need more details on how Paul invented the new Christianity, check our video Bible Proves Jesus is a Prophet, complete reference. Link is in the description and first comment. There was one litmus test that I used for every religion. And when I saw it, whenever I met them or the people or whatever about this religion, I would always ask them, do you have a book? Do you have a book? Because another thing I had come to the conclusion of is that if your religion is true, you should be able to ha tangibly hand me something and show me that this religion is true. Give me something that I can see. I don't want to hear that faith stuff anymore. I heard that all my life, and it look where it got me. It got me thinking I'm driving a Mercedes running around in 1982, beat up Datsun. I said, no, you, you have to show me. And I, so I read the Bhagavad Gita, I read the Torah, I read the Scrolls of Tao, you know, I, I read the, the, the Code of the Bushido, I read the Wiccan Book of Spirits and Spells and all that other magic stuff they have. And I read all of these things, and I found something very congruent with all of it, was that there were very same philosophies and teachings in all of these major religious books. Uh, they all talked about God and His nature. Uh, most of them alluded to the fact that God is one, and that God sends messengers to us and people to us to teach us. But they were filled with a whole bunch of, of, of garbage, to be, to be honest with you, that I couldn't logically, rationally believe. Um, so at about the age of 17, just about, the time, about 17, um, 17 and a half, I, I gave up my search for uh, God and I became kind of angry with God because I said here I am looking for you and I can't find you and it doesn't like you giving me any help and I don't know how many of you know but for a 17 year old is frustrated with God and the world there's a lot of trouble he can get into there's a lot of things he can do uh, to put himself in predicaments uh, when he's frustrated with the world and, and had come to the conception that you know if there's a God that exists then he doesn't really care about me you know that's a kind of a dangerous young man um, so I started doing the whole partying in trouble um, uh, going to parties, drinking underage, all of this stuff I started doing, you know, I, I'm a perfectionist at heart. Uh, so when I was a Christian, I tried to be a, 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 the best one I could. If I was going to switch to being uh, any other religion, then I was going to do that 100%. So you better believe when I went after the dunya, uh, I did that 100%. Every time God sends a prophet to tell the people to go back to his laws and commandments and to worship him only, people change their religion and teachings and make up their own man-made one. There are many more contradictions and mistakes in the Bible, but we don't want this video to be hours long. You can Google yourself who wrote the Bible. When was the New Testament written? You can even find the torn pieces of ancient paper found in random places and somehow became a belief. The most important question now that you need to ask yourself do you really believe in a God that makes laws for you to follow and then tells you, Oh, I made a mistake, sorry, don't follow them anymore, I will kill my son instead? Or do you really believe in a God that is exclusive to only a group of people and it's forbidden for anyone else to believe in him? Or a God that thinks that the earth is a flat square with four corners sailing over water? Or a God that thinks that mountains are the columns that hold the sky from falling on us? Or a God who doesn't know that mountains have roots? Or a God that thinks that the sky is blue because there are more water above it? A God who doesn't know how Judas died and have mistakes in several historical events? A God that tells you to wash your house with bird blood to make it clean? A God that thinks that holy water with dust in it will only curse unfaithful women? A God that encourages slavery and tells us to beat up our slaves but make sure they don't die on the same day because they are our property. A God that cannot make simple math calculations a 60 year old kid can make. A God that tells his prophet to kill women and infant children and to keep some virgin girls for the army men to rape. A God that tells his prophet to kill all the animals for no reason. A God that hates snakes apparently and makes them eat dust. A God that hates women and punishes all of them by labor pain for a sin that they didn't commit. A God that hates women so much he decided to have a son, not a daughter. And then got angry and decided to kill his own son because he lost hope in us following some simple laws. Oh, you can't stop eating pigs? Okay, no problem. I will just kill my son so you can eat as much pig as you want. Really? Do you really believe in a God that tells you that if you defend your husband who is getting attacked, they should cut your hand? A God that thinks that mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds on earth? 
a god that thinks that insects have four legs, a god that needs to rest in the seventh day after creating the heavens and the earth, and then wrestles with Jacob and loses the fight, a god who puts a deceiving spirit in the mouth of his prophets and let them teach us evil religion, a god that doesn't care that people keep changing his words until now, a god who is telling you to take up snakes and to drink poison, a god who created day and night before he created the sun, a god who thinks that a man who repeatedly sleeps with his two daughters until they are pregnant from him is a righteous man? Really? And when God finally sends you a new error-proof book with zero mistakes and zero contradictions, giving you the same laws and the same teachings, while clearing the mistakes and manipulations that have been made to his previous books, you don't even want to give it a try and read it? If you want to know how is it the same teachings, check our video, Was Prophet Muhammad Christian? You will not believe this. Link is in the description and first comment. It was my dad that never read the Bible. He never read one page of the Bible. He goes to church maybe once a year for Christmas, and that's basically it. He isn't into theology at all, but if you ask him who is God, then he will say that God is one, and there's only one God and nobody is like God, right? And I told him about the concept of the Trinity, I think it's roughly, is it two years ago now? No, one and a half years ago, something on those lines. I told him about the concept of the Trinity, and he told me, wow, that sounds totally insane. Why would they believe in that? And I told him, who's they? He said, yeah, you were talking about the Muslims, no? It's Muslims that believe in this, like three in one God, no? No, Dad, that's what we believe. And he couldn't believe me. And he said, it's, it's total insanity. It doesn't make any sense. It's so ridiculous. Why would anybody think of that? And so he tried to wrap his head around it, which my dad usually never does, but he tried to understand it, understand it. And the next day he came to me and I didn't even talk about it anymore. And he came to me the next day and said again, this sounds totally ridiculous. What are you talking about, man? Th this Trinity thing there. I thought we stopped talking about it, man. No, no, but it's really ridiculous. I don't know how they came up with this. It's so crazy. So yeah, anyways, his thoughts about Islam is that Islam is for the Albanians and for the Turks. He's a proud Christian without really understanding the ideology and the theology of Christianity. I'm not saying that to mock my own dad, obviously not. This is just how people grew up on the Balkan. He grew up in Yugoslavia under communism, so they didn't learn anything about the religion. They simply knew what they were, and that's basically it. And yeah, nevertheless, he's identified as a Christian. He's identified as a Macedonian, and therefore would heavily disagree with me. And for the rest of my family, it would be extremely strange, extremely strange, especially because I was so against Islam. So to my closest family, like sister, mother, etc., etc., it would be extremely strange because I hated Islam with a vengeance. I just hated it. And therefore, they would be shocked. Quran is the only available scripture from God that is as it is, from the Prophet's mouth to your ears, never changed. People of Moses saw him split the sea, People of Jesus saw him heal the ill. People of Muhammad saw him split the moon in half. Each of them saw proof. It's not fair for them to see miracles and then believe, and for you to take a leap of faith. You deserve proof too. Isn't that fair? We have a whole playlist of scientific information discovered just in this century, but described accurately in the Quran long before that. Link is in the description and first comment. These examples in the playlist and many others which we didn't cover are the proof that the Quran can only be the words of God himself. And that is your miracle. It said that Muslims were people who uh, worshipped a moon god named, named Allah, uh, who lived in a box in the desert in Saudi Arabia, and uh, they were oppressive to women. The one thing that really caught my attention was the whole uh, chapter on jihad, where it said that Muslims were allowed to kill non-Muslims at any time, at any place, without discretion, and it was an honorable act, and not only would they go to heaven before it, but they would get 70 versions on the way. You know, so I closed the book on Islam, put it back on the shelf, and marked off Islam off my little list of religions, and said thanks, but no thanks, and if I ever see a Muslim, I am out. Um, and I said, I'm pretty safe in Greenville, South Carolina, I had never seen a Muslim ever. So I said, you know, I don't have to worry about running into no Muslims, thank God. So, you know, I, I, I I started, you know, just worshiping, you know, I tried to just be a good person, you know, pray to God, ask him for guidance, try to be a genuinely good person. He said, have you ever heard of Islam? 
I said, yes, I've heard all about Islam. <laughs> he was like, okay, so what do you think of it? I said, what do you mean what I think of it? That's probably the worst religion I've ever seen on the face of the planet. He's like, why? And he's like, but I'm a Muslim. I was like, man, you gotta stop playing. <laughs> you know, like, you're, you're, you're an African American. You know, he's like, so? I'm like, the book said you guys were Arabs. All the Muslims were Arabs. He, and, and he was like, what else did you read in the book? And I told him, he was like, man, what in the, you know, what have you been reading? <laughs> He's like, you need to, 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 to go uh, to the mosque for Juma. He's like, I, he, he told me, he said, I'm not a good Muslim. This is what he said to me. He said, I'm not a good Muslim. I, I'm not even going to uh, try to front and say I'm a good Muslim. He said, but I can guide you to some people that can tell you the real truth about Islam uh, because he know about my story about wanting to find religion. And he said, you need to go to the mosque for Juma. And I said, what's, what's Juma? He said, it's just like church with no chairs. <laughs> and I said, I can do church with no chairs because in church, the chairs were the worst part anyway. <laughs> because they have these hard benches that you sit on that are like this, and they're so hard. I said, that's good, you sit on carpet? Wow, man, they should, every church should be like that. You know, at first I was shocked, like I've been living across the street from all these crazy Muslims all my life. <laughs> you know, I said, I never knew. You know, and he told me to go to Juma, and I asked him what time. He, he said he would meet me there at one o'clock in the afternoon on Friday. So I said, okay, I went on Friday and I'm waiting outside for him. You know, I'm, I'm not going inside, that's not happening. So I went in and they put me in the back and gave me a chair anyway. And I said, I came to sit on the floor. And they gave me a chair anyway, you know, and all of these people are piled up in front of me and there's no Americans here. And I'm starting to wonder, you know, uh, if this is a setup, because it's starting to smell like a setup to me. Because in my mind, I'm like, you've been set up before and this, this seems kind of like this. So, and I'm starting to think in my head, you know, scenarios, you know, a young mind at play. And I said, this, this, this other guy, my friend, he probably was in the same situation like me, and he probably made a deal with them to get out as long as he brought other Americans and tricked them into coming to the mosque so they could do their jihad after Juma and get their 70 virgins. <laughs> so I'm sitting here, and there's all these people in front of me, and then there's a curtain with all these people behind me making noise, and I have no idea who's back here. So I'm stuck in the middle of this. I hear that it's some women, uh, but I don't, you know, I, there's a curtain. I have no idea. So I'm like, there's something very odd about what's going on right here. I'm like, just let me make it. I'm starting to look for the exit. I'm like, you know, calculating how many people are between me and the exit. You know, I, I know some martial arts. So I said, I'm going to hit a couple of them and I'm out. And then the imam came and I, I just now realized that he was the imam because he got up on the minbar, you know, and they, and they started to call the adhan. And, you know, I said, okay, that man seemed nice. He seemed generally nice. So I, I felt a little more comfort. And then he got up uh, uh, after the, the adhan and he started his khutbah. Inna alhamdulillah nahmaruhu wa I said, oh my God. I said, I bet you he's talking about me. You know, and he's being forceful. You know, he was getting loud and banging on the minbar and he's pointing in my direction. You know, I'm like, oh man, I gotta get out of here really quick, you know. I said, well, I'm gonna take my chance with the women behind me. I'm going through the curtain. And then he started to, when he got done with his Arabic tirade, um, he started to explain it. You know, uh, that verily all praise belongs to, to, to uh, Allah alone, our God alone, and, and Him do we worship, and Him do we seek help and assistance. We seek refuge with Him from the evil that lies. You know, he explained what he said in Arabic, and it sounded to me so beautiful. It was very, very beautifully prose what he said, and I wanted to know where he got that. You know, I said, where did he get that? And then he tried to explain it to me a little bit how I came by. I said, ah, just give me the book, because the book should speak for itself. Um, so I took the Quran home, and on Friday night I started to read it, because this is a book I had never seen before. Uh, and I was very interested. So I, I went home and I opened this, opened the Quran, and I read the Fatiha. It seemed to me kind of like the Lord's Prayer, you know, it was a little, a little similar to what I found in the Bible. Um, but then I started to read Surah Al-Baqarah. Uh, I started to read some of the Al-Iman, and I started to see names that I had seen before. I started to see names like Abraham, Moses, David, Jesus, uh, Yahya, John the Baptist, Zechariah, Mary, and I said, I know all of these names, but there was something different about these people in this book. Uh, the prophets that I found in the Bible uh, were people that were deplorable, of, of not very character. These same men in the Quran were someone who were at the highest echelon of moral character and moral fiber. They were someone that was an example to be followed because they lived the message that they preached. Therefore, they were uh, able to be followed and emulated. So, I read all of these chapters and I, and I read the story of, of Jesus. Uh, what was the thing that made you question your beliefs?
and uh, when was it? When I found that there were contradictions in the Bible, I found out from the, actually the vicar, he was very good and he was very honest. And I said, well, you know, what's this, you know, why should I believe in God? Why should I believe in the Bible? And he said, well, you have to believe in your heart. And I said, well, what's the proof? So I asked him these questions. You know, well, you've got to believe in your heart. It's a feeling. And I thought, well, I believe in God, but actually if this text, if this book can't uh, prove that it's the word of God, and it has contradictions in it. And actually, if it was God's word, in my opinion, it would be perfect with no contradictions. Then actually, I don't think I can follow that. What were your thoughts about Islam? Well, I'd always mix with Muslims. Um, even as a, as a child, my father, as a professor, he had students who were Muslim. And so my first contact with Islam actually was through a girl that I used to go nightclubbing with as a, as a 17, 18 year old. I was about, probably about 18. And at the time, I left home at 16. I mean, this is how rebellious I was. And she said, no, come and stay at my house. So I went to stay at her house and she only had one book in the house. And this book is El Quran. And the Qur'an, it just was the English and Arabic version. And so I said to her, because I was bored, teenager, I was bored, and I was like, oh, look at this book. Can I have a look? So she said, okay, go have a wash, wash your hands. And <laughs> you can open the book and have a look. So I opened the book and I saw, subhanAllah, I saw the stories that I'd seen and loved in my Sunday school days. And I was like, wow, that's familiar. Because at school, and this is really important to know, in the West at school, you're taught Islam, Christianity as two completely separate things. There's no uh, autonomy or, or comparison between God and Allah. Allah is for Muslims and God is for Christians. It's like they're different gods, different religions. And um, that's what I had understood. And so I started asking questions to my friend. What's this book? Why is it so similar to Christianity? The sheikh obviously gave him some verses, some ayat, which were relevant to what I was asking, which was scientific proof. I said, wow, that's amazing. And then he added something that was key, was that, oh, by the way, this was revealed to an illiterate guy in a desert like 1400 years ago. I was blown away. These were people I could follow. These were prophets. This was a book of guidance. And this was something that the book is calling and appealing to me. That if you don't believe in this book, you will never see that. I've never seen this in any other scripture. The direct challenges that are in the Quran, that if you don't believe this book is true, put it to the test. Put it to the test. And this was something that was so astounding to me. That God is telling you over and over again, if you don't believe this is the truth, test it. Bring me something else like it. Test it. Put it to test. If it was written, if there was more than I mean, all of the analogies about God, everything was so logical, so rational, so reasonable in my mind that it was like two plus two equals four and that was it. There was no one plus one plus one equals three, egg, yolk, water, flight. There was none of that foolishness. The Quran was very direct and very straightforward in its teachings. So I gave my heart to Islam. Uh, that night in, uh, in my living room reading the Quran and you know, and I, I cried and cried, you know, that I had been looking for the truth all this time, had searched all this way and it was right across the street. It was like my whole being was immersed in a warm, fizzy feeling, what, like completely enveloped. Of course, this is Halawat al-Iman. So I had this halawat al-Iman, I remember turning to my friend and I said to her, I want to become Muslim and I want to do this like now. Do you know what the leap of faith they ask you to do is? The leap of faith is another word for ignoring all of these mistakes and blindly believing in a book written by men, thinking that it's from God. If they have proof, or at least if it makes sense, they will not ask you to take a leap of faith. The good news is, you don't have to anymore. I'm telling you, if you don't see proof, if it has mistakes, don't believe in anything blindly. God didn't ask you to pretend that a book full of mistakes is holy. God didn't ask you to completely go against logic and science just to have faith. And I always tell people, if you want to become an atheist, read and study the Bible. I used to be a devoted evangelical Christian. And I'm not talking about the kind of Christian that just shows up at church on Sunday and puts a Jesus quote on their Facebook bio. I used to get up every single morning and have a one to two hour quiet time with God where I would read the Bible and write in my journal and pray. I used to spend my extra babysitting money on books about creationism and apologetics and theology. And all I wanted as a 16, 17 year old girl was to make God proud. 
and to be a shining light for Jesus. And so I studied the Bible a lot. But the more I studied, the more questions I had. And when I would come across something that didn't sit right with my sensibilities, I wouldn't just shrug it off and say, well, God's ways are higher than mine. You just gotta have faith. I wanted to be able to give an answer to anybody who questioned me about my faith. And the more I learned, the more questions I had and the less answers I had. And over time, I really started to see a very different story than what the church had taught me, a very different God than what the church had taught me. We start learning about how the Bible was formed, who wrote it or who didn't write it, the church history, where these stories came from, how the church has molded them and changed them to fit a narrative. That's when all of it started to fall apart for me. And I genuinely just wanted truth. I wanted to know the true God, not the God that my parents taught me, not the God that my church had taught me, not the God that was acceptable within society. I wanted to know the true God. Don't base your whole destiny and salvation on something that you know is a lie. God promised he will show you proof before asking you to worship him. <laughs> We will show them our signs in the horizons and in themselves until it becomes evident to them that He is the truth. Scientific knowledge that was written in the Quran 1400 years ago was only available to humanity 50 years ago. Who else can write this other than God Himself? It's a miracle. You should see it first and then decide. And if the miracle doesn't convince you, you're free to decide whatever you want. But if you refuse to even check it out, you're making a huge regretful mistake. For two years I was battling with this thought and I was trying to understand the Trinity and I was trying to make myself believe the Trinity but after all, all of those intentions have failed miserably because I couldn't convince myself of a three-headed God. It didn't work, no matter how I looked at it, it just didn't add up, didn't make sense for me and therefore I was quite surprised, honestly quite shocked that my religion entailed that. This was a wake-up call for me because I was seeking a God in its unity, in its oneness, if you will, and not God as some sort of deity that I cannot comprehend. I always remind myself of the saying, your God is not a God of confusion. So it was very confusing to me, after all. Hence, for the very first time in my life, I considered, you know what, I'm going to read the enemy's book, the Quran. Why not? Because I started watching David Wood videos. And David Wood was so confident in his message that Muhammad was this degenerate guy and Islam was this evil, evil religion coming from Satan himself. The biggest deception known to mankind. The real Antichrist is Islam. So I got convinced even more about my own faith. I became arrogant, pompous. I said, God brought me back to orthodoxy, the real religion. He brought me back to the truth. And now I can truly see that Islam is from the devil. And because I have those eyes to see, I'm going to read the Quran and dismantle it. Many Muslims during that time reached out to me via YouTube, many followers of mine are Muslim, and said, hey, give it a shot. I said, no worries. I'm going to check it out and I'm going to find the devil in your book. So I opened the Quran and I started reading. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the merciful. That was surprising to me. It really was. I know to most Muslims this is simply common sense. They're wondering what I'm talking about. But for me as a Christian, I didn't remember a page in the Bible that addresses God like that first. I kept on reading and I noticed that every surah, every chapter starts like that. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the merciful. And I was impressed. The message is crystal clear. By reading the Quran itself, it doesn't posture up or pose as something else. It simply says what it is. It comes as a guidance. It comes as a clarification for those that want to see. Again, very, very powerful, I have to say. So I continued reading. So devout yourself to the religion of monotheism. The natural instinct, Allah, God, has instilled in mankind. Yet again, simple but powerful. It rings true to me. It makes sense that we have a natural disposition in which we seek God. I think anybody can relate to that. When you were a child, most of us, we knew that there was a God. The oneness of God was crystal clear to us. We didn't think about other deities. We didn't think about a three-headed God system. 
Yes, I was shocked because Islam for me was a violent religion, a religion of the enemy, a religion of the devil, not a religion of the oneness of God, the oneness of God that everybody comprehends. Even my father, who is a Christian Orthodox, he doesn't go to church, he never read the Bible. When I ask him about God, he tells me that God is one, that God is the most powerful. He understands that too intuitively. And I am of the firm conviction, sue me, but that you don't have to be an intellectual in order to understand God. Intellectualism, study, doctoral titles, all of that is fine here on earth in this creation. And you can impress other people with it, but instinctive understanding is embedded in you and even a beggar can understand God within. That's how I see it. And therefore the Quran confirmed that. For me it was quite shocking however to realize after reading the Quran that most Muslims that I've met in my life, not all, but most Muslims that I've met in my life, actually didn't follow the Quran at all. Actually weren't even considered real Muslims. The Quran talked about humility. The Quran talked against being boastful. The Quran talked about no compulsion in religion. The Quran talked about that God guides who he wills. Another powerful message yet again is, it is Allah's pattern, ongoing since the past. You will never find any change in Allah's pattern. That sentence really struck home because it showed the beautiful simplicity of the message. God's way is always the same. There is no change in the way, in the pattern of God. It is always the same, always accessible, the same way. And that of course made me think a lot about my own faith and about Christianity. Thinking about the sacrifice of Jesus for us, him being crucified so our sins can be forgiven, made me truly think about the people before him and people that didn't hear the message, etc, etc. Guys, needless to say, I obviously didn't find the devil within the Quran, but I found many, many warnings about the devil. The Quran warns multiple times about the devil. It clarifies how sneaky the devil is, it warns you of the devil, and it glorifies God. God over and over and over again. Honestly, I tried to find the devil in the detail, but I failed. I couldn't find the devil within that scripture, no matter how hard I looked. Now, looking back, I really wonder where David Wood is getting his information from. It's quite interesting because I was following David Wood for roughly one and a half years, and he was so adamant in his work warning all the people of bad, bad Islam. But after reading the Quran, I couldn't find the devil in it. I couldn't find the evil in it that was proclaimed by all the Christian apologists. I couldn't find the maliciousness, the perversion within the Quran. I found a concise, clear message within it. Take care, there are a lot of people who don't want you to read it even once. They want you to stay ignorant. We can talk about how their whole financial profits are dependent on your ignorance in another video. Subscribe so you won't miss it. But for now, we just want to emphasize on this. These people scaring you away from the Quran will not help you on the day of judgment. These people will not defend you when God asks you, why did you ignore my message to you? Why didn't you even read it and check for yourself if it's from me or fabricated? Nothing will change. It's basically the same teachings and laws, but you will get the correct description of who God is and who were his prophets. There is no difference between Romans' hate towards early Christians and your hate towards Muslims now. Don't let the media spreading lies about Muslims fool you. Don't let the media spreading lies about Quran fool you. Reading it yourself one time is enough for you to see the truth with your own eyes. Quran is not the book for Arabs, just like Bible is not the book for Aramaic and Hebrew people. Scriptures are for everyone. Rejecting Quran without reading it once is just arrogance. The Quran is not an Arabic copy of the Bible because if it was a copy, it will copy the same mistakes. It has the same teachings from the same God, but clarifies the mistakes and modifications and manipulations made by men on all their scriptures. If it's a copy, it will just copy the mistakes too. أفتطمعون أن يؤمنوا لكم وقد كان فريق منهم يسمعون كلام الله وقد كان فريق منهم يسمعون كلام الله ثم يحرفونه من بعد ما عقلوه وهم يعلمون 
Do you hope that they will believe you when a group of them used to hear the speech of Allah and then distorted after they had understood knowingly? لقد كفر الذين قالوا إن الله هو المسيح بن مريم وقال المسيح يا بني إسرائيل اعبدوا الله ربي وربكم إنه من يشرك بالله فقد حرم الله عليه الجنة ومأواه النار وما للظالمين من أنصار They have certainly disobeyed who say Allah is the Messiah, the son of Mary while the Messiah said, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. Indeed, he who associates others with Allah, Allah has forbidden him paradise, and his refuge is the hellfire, and there are not for the wrongdoers any helpers. <laughs> وَإِن لَّمْ يَنْتَهُوا عَمَّا يَقُولُونَ لَيَمَسَّنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ Most surely, those who said, indeed Allah is the third of three, has denied faith. For there is no God except one God. And if they do not refrain from what they say, a painful punishment will very truly befall those of them who have denied. أفلا يتوبون إلى الله ويستغفرونه والله غفور رحيم. Will they not repent to Allah and ask His forgiveness? For Allah is forgiving, is doing of mercy. ما المسيح بن مريم إلا رسول قد خلت من قبله الرسل وأمه صديقة كان يأكلان الطعام. انظر كيف نبين لهم الآيات ثم انظر أنا يؤفكون The Messiah son of Mary is no more than a messenger before whom other messengers have passed away and his mother was an unwavering believer They both used to eat food Look how we make the signs evident for them Then look how they are still averted from the truth You are taking a huge risk following this book which is full of mistakes while rejecting God's message to you without reading it once? Take care that God said that people who do that are forbidden from paradise. Get rid of your ego. Get rid of every lie that you heard on television before. And read the Quran yourself and then judge. It's time to rethink your life decisions before it's too late. So one day my daughter comes home, second grade maybe. She was telling me about this little boy who sat across from her. His mom came to get him. She, she said she had scarves on her and she had a dress all the way down to her feet and couldn't see her on nothing but her eyeballs. At that point, I snapped. Started spewing things out of my mouth that should never be said in front of children or anything. She didn't say anything. It was the look on her face. I remember my daughter looking at me like I was absolutely the craziest person on the face of the earth. She was my little buddy. Yeah, she used to say we were road dogs. <laughs> I know, I, I, I saw it in her eyes, I made her question that love. And that's when the light bulb came on. I decided to give the people of this community one more chance. So I went to the Islamic Center, see a gentleman in the shoe room taking off his shoes. He looks at me and he smiles. He said, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I want you to teach me about Islam. So he went and he gave me a Quran. Read this, come back when you have questions. So I did. And I would see things in the book. I'd be like, there it is. I got them right there. Explain that to me. And they would. This was a, a kind of awakening. Long story short, eight weeks after that first day I stepped into the Islamic Center, I became a Muslim. I'm a Muslim, a veteran, and a proud American. I had learned that I was completely wrong about everything that I felt. You know, Judaism had a message, Christianity had a message, Islam had a message. Funny thing is though, it was the same message. It was about peace and it was about love. Please join me in welcoming Mr. McKinney. My big thing is now to stop the hate. Nothing good has ever come out of hatred. I've done too many things. I've hurt a lot of people. I have to live with that. But if I can stop somebody else, on the path of non-forgiveness, I won.
Finally, we need to address one last issue. Some will say that if it's not copied from the Bible, maybe it was copied from different religious books that were available in this time period. Let's take a look at some of the available knowledge back then. If you read the Atharwa Veda 4.11.1, you will find that there is a big ball holding up the earth. If you read the Atharva Veda 6.44.3, you will find that God drinks urine. If you read Rig Veda 1.58, you will find that the sun is driving a two-wheeled, horse-drawn vehicle and getting pulled by seven horses. This is why the sun is moving. And what about the hundreds of scientific facts written in the Quran? How did Muhammad know all that? Maybe he talked to the best scientists of his era, right? Maybe Aristotle? Aristotle thought that the brain was a radiator. The blood flows inside it to cool down, which kept all important heart from overheating. Aristotle believed that men have more teeth than women. Even though he was married, he must never have counted. Aristotle thought that worms grow to be snakes. Aristotle thought that semen converts period blood into solid, like converting milk into cheese. This is how new life begins. Aristotle thought that the upper part of the fetus is created first, then the lower part. Then Muhammad didn't copy from Aristotle. Maybe Galen? Galen said that there is a dwarf embryo in the male sperm which is nourished by the female semen until it grows to be a fetus. Galen said that the semen is white blood. Galen and Hippocrate strongly believed that the right testicle made the boy sperm and the left testicle made the girl sperm. As early as 330 BC, Aristotle prescribed dying off the left testicle in men wishing to have boys. Until the French Revolution, men were making surgeries to remove the left testicle because it was believed that the right testicle produced boys and the left one produced girls. Hippocrates thought that babies are created from heat and the woman's womb is like an oven that heats the baby to create its bones. That is why the Quran describes the stages of creation of the human fetus from sperm to baby exactly as if it was written next to a modern fetal ultrasonic machine. They attach to the epithelial cells lining the oviduct where they stay and can quickly detach and move when ovulation gets closer. In short, they can stay attached in the woman for a couple of days at least before she ovulates, detach and move closer to the egg when ovulation does occur and then attach again to the egg. It's an uphill battle all the way until one strong and determined sperm manages to attach itself to the egg. Within seconds, the sperm is engulfed by the egg. This is a process called phagocytosis by scientists, meaning that the sperm is ingested or engulfed by the egg. After this happens, the sperm's nuclear envelope disintegrates and the sperm and egg become a one-cell embryo, as reported by Story in 1995 and Evans in 2001 respectively. When you think about all that, it's hard not to admit that embryology is truly a miraculous process. And just as miraculous as the process itself is the fact that the Quran, a book revealed in the 6th century, described this intricate process so accurately all those years ago. How did the author of the Quran know? Do you still think Muhammad copied from science books? Tales of Miletus said that the originating principle of nature was a single material substance, water. All Chinese culture thought that human joints are 365, like the number of days in the year. And this was corrected by Prophet Muhammad to exactly 360 joints 1400 years ago, and then by Nature magazine in 2020 to be exactly 360 joints. Sorry, Nature Magazine, you are 1400 years late to this discovery. All of these religious and scientific mistakes were first corrected by the illiterate Muhammad in the middle of the desert 1400 years ago, and again these days using modern technology. Miracles are not part of historical legends. You have your own miracle right now. You just refuse to read it because they told you not to read it on television. Quran breaks the logical expectations and breaks the boundaries of what is possible for a man by having a lot of information that in no way can be written in it unless it is from the one who created knowledge. The one who created everything. 
we provided more than 50 examples for you in our playlist Real Miracles in the 21st Century. Link is in the description and first comment. People reject Islam because it's from the Middle East. People think that Islam is the religion of the Middle East and Christianity is the religion of Europe. Actually, Christianity is from the Middle East too. Jesus was from the Middle East. Even Paul, who said you don't have to follow the laws like Jesus anymore, and who claimed to talk to God, was from Turkey, and claimed to talk to God in Syria. It's not about nationalism. It's not about us versus them. It's about what is the truth. And if you're taking your religion from the Middle East anyway, at least take the correct one. If you consider for one moment, just one second, that there is an Akhirah, yeah? You don't believe in it, but what if you're wrong? If you consider that for one second that you are wrong, is it not better to take uh, precaution, like when you wear your seatbelt? Take precaution, give religion a moment. And I'm not talking about a uh, religion of different hodgepodge beliefs and rituals, I'm talking about Islam. Give the Quran time, read it. If after you read it, you disbelieve in it, then that's up to you. But if you want, if you do read it and something changes your life like it did for me, then it's only going to be for the better of you. Even in modern days, some theories are still jokes. We debunked the whole evolution theory with scientific proof in our video titled Capitalism Failed to Fuel Evolution. Nice try. Link is also in the description and first comment. They say if you want to become an atheist, you should read the Bible. That is correct because the truth is not an option. You either believe in an illogical book filled with mystics and contradictions or believe that the universe created itself and we all came to life by random chance. Actually, being a result of random mutations makes more sense than the Bible. But they are forgetting the third option. The only logical, bulletproof option. The miracle Quran. If you deny the truth without even seeing it, you are left to choose between two lies. Don't fall into this trap. They will tell you, do you believe in science or do you believe in God? Yes. Without Quran, you have to choose one of them because Bible has a lot of scientific mistakes. But with the Quran, you can believe in both science and God. Because, of course, when I started writing the book, a lot of people think that it was a political book. But it wasn't so much a political book, it was a religious book because I wanted to show people why Islam was a danger as a religion. And I wrote it from a Christian perspective. So in the beginning, I made a comparison between the Christian concept of God and the Islamic concept. So I started comparing it. But because I had these doubts about the Trinity and I saw Tawhid, eh, the oneness of God in Islam, I thought, yeah, that sounds a little bit more logical. And then I thought to myself, well, I reread the Bible to see, to refresh myself, to see, okay, why isn't the concept of Islam, the Tawhid concept, isn't the Christian concept? But when I was reading the Old Testament and I saw what the Old Testament prophet said, it was one God, one God, one God. And then I thought, okay, I'll look only at the words of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. And then there's this story in the New Testament there where a guy comes to Jesus and he asks him, what is the most important thing in life? How can I gain paradise? And he said, there are two things. He says, here, O Israel, here your God is one. Treat your neighbor as you want to be treated yourself. So I thought, well, even Jesus Christ says here, Oh Israel, your God is one. So I thought, well, this whole Muslim concept of God sounds more logical, and it's the same concept that I find in the Old and the New Testament. And I know Christianity as a religion teaches something else, but it isn't the concept of God that I find in the Bible. And I was writing an anti-Islam book with an anti-Islam purpose, and I'm asking this Muslim professor from another country, can you help me? <laughs> so I told him, I'm writing a book. I have a lot of questions. So I, I was very plain why I thought, why is Islam promoting terrorism? Why is anti-woman? Why is anti Christian, and I whatever. I read all these books and articles and made com a comparison between prophets from the Old Testament with Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. I had no arguments anymore to say they are prophets and he is not. And I thought to myself, well, if I accept Moses on these grounds and I cannot accept the prophet, then there is something else. So I thought, why don't I think he is a prophet? And I thought, oh, perhaps because he had many wives. But then again, when you look at Solomon or you look at King David, Abraham, there are a lot of people in the Old Testament that had more 
more wives. And when you look at even outside of the religious books, culturally in Europe, in, in Africa, Asia, everywhere, there were men with several wives uh, for several reasons. So I thought to myself, well, that cannot be a reason either. So one by one, all these reasons fell. And in the end, I thought, well, I have to say all of them are not prophets, but I, I didn't believe that because I thought, well, the things they did, they said, the miracles that happened, etc. they were confirmed in what they said and what they did. So they are. And then I said, well, then I have to accept that the Prophet Muhammad perhaps is a prophet too. So I was doubting it. So first I thought, well, it's the most evil person I know because of the history. Then I said, well, perhaps it's not that evil, but he's not a prophet. And in the end, I started doubting perhaps he is a prophet. Yeah, that took, of course, me reading a lot of books again. And the one thing that I think was very wise of Abdul Hakim Murad to say was, he said, well, the books you read about with the anti-Islam arguments are written by non-Muslims. He said, if you want to know more about Christianity, you don't read books from atheists. You start reading the books from the Christians. Why do they believe this? What are the arguments? So he said, you have to do the same with Islam. So start reading Islamic books from Islamic teachers, from Islamic scholars, etc. And then you can see if you compare the books on the same topic of people who are Muslim and wrote those books and non-Muslim, you can see where they took the wrong turn, where they translated words in the wrong way, sometimes perhaps even not on purpose, but just because they didn't know where things are added, where things left out of it. When I thought that, I thought, yeah, well, I have these arguments for him being a prophet. I see his character. I see the way he treated other people. I see how he treated his enemies. I think he is a prophet. But then I thought to myself, whoa, that's horrible because I already accepted this oneness of God. And now I say he is a prophet. If I say there is only one God and Muhammad is his prophet, it's almost Shahada. So I thought to myself, okay, let's close the books. <laughs> Stop. This is going in the wrong direction. And of course, I wasn't that anti-Islam anymore because of what I read, what I saw and what I experienced. What I tell you now, it sounds a little like a fairy tale, but it really happened. In the end, there were all these books at the table. And when I had this feeling of, yeah, hey, this is Shahada in a way, I thought, well, I put all the books away and I put uh, the books on the highest shelf. But there were so many books that a lot of books fell off the shelf. And one of the books that fell off the shelf was the Quran. And when I picked it up, my hand was on a page with Surah 22, Ayat 46. And it says, it's not the eyes that are blind, but the hearts. And I thought to myself, that really is my problem because it wasn't the eyes. I, I really could see what I've written down myself. Nobody forced me to write this book. Nobody said you have to write this or that. I started writing myself and I could see it with my own eyes, but I still couldn't accept the fact that I said he is a prophet. There is this one God. I just couldn't. So it wasn't my eyes that were blind. It was really my heart. I couldn't accept it. I think my nafs or my nafs or whatever, my ego, I, I couldn't accept it. And I said, well, God, I don't care if it's the God from the Bible or the Quran, give me a sign or something so that I 100% and sure, no, this is the way. And I went to bed, but when I woke up, I felt very secure in myself. I really felt very secure. I've, I've never been more secure about anything else. The whole anxiety or the whole doubting issue it disappeared like, like snow for the sun. And I thought to myself, well, I think I'm a Muslim. Before Quran, Arabs were ignorant tribes in the desert, worshipping idols, selling idols, selling slaves, drinking wine, starting tribal wars for little to no reason, killing their own babies if they were female, and gambling their money and their own families. A man would bet his wife on a cards game and then lose her when he loses the bet. Also adultery was everywhere, and women were treated as sex objects. The last thing they cared about was morality or knowledge. It was a materialistic society based on gaining more money and power by any means. And then, Quran ended slavery, racism, discrimination against minorities, and discrimination against women, and gave equal rights and justice to everyone more than 1,000 years before the whole world started even thinking about it. Quran gave meaning to family values and mutual respect and ended adultery. Quran ended tribalism and nationalism and united nearly two-thirds of the world into one big loving community. Quran cleansed the hearts of people from any evil and created a just, safe, happy society. Quran converted illiterate Arabs to be the world leaders in science, medicine, engineering, culture and economics for nearly a thousand years while the rest of the world was in its darkest ages. Before Quran, the rich would become richer and the poor would become poorer. But after Quran, there were days when callers would walk in the streets in cities from east to west looking for someone to take charity and no one wanted it. Then the callers would look for someone who needs financial help getting married, they couldn't find any. Turns out that if there is no greed, there will be no poverty. For 700 years, the international language of science was Arabic and Baghdad was the center of the intellectual world. In the Moroccan city of Fez, Fatima al-Fihri founded the famous Al-Qarawiyyin University, 
Today it is recognized as the oldest existing university in the world. They didn't lose their leadership until they lost their connection with Quran and started turning away from it. And before you ask, there is not a single country in the world right now which follows the teachings of Quran. There is no country on earth right now that represents the teachings of God in the Quran. What you see now is them not following the Quran, not the opposite. Judge the book, don't judge the people. Every year hundreds of thousands of people around the world from different countries, different continents and different languages accept Quran as their purpose and way of life as soon as they just read it once. See how the number of believers is increasing very, very rapidly recently? People are tired of lies after lies. Whenever they finally find the truth, they hold on it and never let go. What do you expect after you read the words of God who created you? As a Christian that converted to Islam myself, I could tell you that there are so many people out there that don't even know about Islam. People might look at Muslims and think something they've heard, they've seen, whatever. No, forget all that. What I want to tell you right now is what Muslims believe, and that is that God, the creator of everything, Allah, Almighty God, He is only one without any partners, only one. Do not say that he is a trinity. Do not say that he has equals. This is shirk. This is the unforgivable sin, subhanAllah. Number two, if you believe in the oneness of Allah and you believe in the prophets that he sent, and that includes Adam, the first human, all the way to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam as the last and final messenger, subhanAllah. And if you believe in the holy books, the revelations Allah sent prophets with, like Prophet Moses, Prophet Jesus, <laughs> Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, may peace be upon them all. And Muslims believe in the angels. There are angels with us at all times. And last but not least, Muslims believe in the day of judgment. We believe that after the world has ended, all humans will be resurrected. Allah will raise us all up and that is when the day of judgment will start and we will all be judged for how we live this life on earth. Don't try to find an excuse to ignore God's message to you. God created you for a purpose. At least know what is it. Don't worry, it's not like what you heard in the media. See with your own eyes you have nothing to lose. Quran is the only book that broke the barriers of time and the barriers of knowledge. Quran is the only book that can be called perfect and contains a cure for our social diseases and hatred towards each other and division. 1% of the people now own 99% of Earth's resources, while billions are dying from poverty, hunger, diseases and wars over man-made borders. This is not the world we want to live in. Quran is the only book that can fix all that. Quran is the only unchanged book written by the most wise, the creator of us, the one who knows what is best for us and what is wrong. Do you still refuse to read it once before you decide for yourself if you believe it or not? He says, well, what do you think about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? And I said, well, uh, he says, do you think he's a prophet? I said, yeah, I do. I said, I think he's a prophet. He had a word also, but I don't believe that was for me. I believe that it was for a different uh, group of people. And uh, he looked at me and he stuck his finger in my face and he says, you're a Muslim, man. And uh, then I, I returned the finger and I said, no. I said, I'm not a Muslim. And my name and that word will never be connected. So uh, that day there was something inside me. It, it was like a, a dot. There was some type of dot that had been put in my heart. So back in the day, I had my old Packard Bell. You know, it was uh, not many people know what a Packard Bell is today. They don't exist. And uh, so I would I would go on there and I would ask Jeeves, which Jeeves was the, the Google of today back then. So I would go and ask Jeeves, uh, just type in Islamic topics. One day I'd come home from work and uh, I was, you know, just, just following my normal routine, come home from work, take off my shoes and everything, get comfortable and sat down at my computer. You know, what is Islam? You know, give the five pillars of Islam. When I read them, for some reason, I. I read La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and I said I believe that and then I read uh, you know make Hajj you know to fast to pay zakat to pray every pillar that I read it was like something had opened I can't explain it it was like if my heart was being painted or a light was opening inside me then once I had finished reading all the five pillars I knew that I couldn't go any other direction that was the only direction that I could go and uh, there was a, a link to, uh, it said how to be Muslim so you, I clicked that link and there was a small PDF that opened up I'm holding this piece of paper and then I fought, I went to the bathroom I took my shahada in a bathroom uh, by myself I went in the bathroom I la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah 
if you need help reading the last and final message from our creator to us, we can assign someone who knows Arabic to read it with you and to answer all of your questions for free. Just join our Facebook and Discord and contact us to schedule your daily voice or video call, whatever you wish. Links are in the description and first comment. We will answer all of your questions and if after reading it you're not convinced, then no harm, no foul. You can just go back to believing whatever you want to believe, knowing that you did what you should and you searched for God in every way possible. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe and to hit that bell icon. Salam alaikum.